a lengthy excerpt from a six-hour interview I did with the late Owsley Stanley, also known as Bear, who uh, died in a car crash in Australia a couple of weeks ago. Owsley Stanley changed the world in many, many ways, um, uh, particularly in the San Francisco music scene by providing the cleanest and purest acid anybody had ever eaten around here, and by developing sound systems uh, and concepts of sound reinforcement. It, his home stereo, which was a rather oversized affair to be sure, was the first PA system in the Fillmore Auditorium. Before Owsley came on the scene, um, there were no rock and roll PA systems. When the Beatles played Candlestick Park, they used the uh, sound system in the uh, stadium, the same one that the PA announcer used to say who was coming up to bat. Um, and uh, there's just so much to this guy. Uh, as you'll hear in this conversation, I just got back from a two-week tour, and I listened to this interview all the way through more than twice, trying to get a handle on it and figure out how I could edit it and put it into shape. And there was just so much and so many interesting digressions that I couldn't really figure out what to do. Uh, to I, I, I wound up basically cutting it into major pieces uh, and just giving you the sort of first half of it basically to make it uh, fit into this two hour slot but there's just so much more uh, much of this interview is published in a book called Conversations with the Dead which is available these days as an e-book for your Kindle or whatever through Amazon um, and is uh, I think worth reading the entire thing <clears throat> so let me just begin with the first section of this interview with the late Owsley Stanley later on in the program I'm going to be giving away tickets to screenings of the Grateful Dead movie. It's happening coast to coast on April 20th, and there are quite a few theaters in the Bay Area uh, that will be showing it, and I've been given uh, several pairs of passes for each of several theaters, and we'll get into that a little later. I want to get started on the interview with Owsley Stanley right now so you can get a handle on the amazing mind. I wanted you to hear what this guy's voice sounded like, too. Um, uh, just an amazing and fascinating character in every way. And let's just begin with the interview that took place in January of 1991. I always got the impression that you almost mixed for those tapes more than for the halls sometimes. I mean, that Bear's Choice is a pretty excellent balance of stuff. I never paid attention to the tape. I just uh, would put the headphones on and listen to the tape in order to make sure there was enough... Um, of the guitar and bass, which wasn't being amplified by the PA. Right. So I made sure that, that balanced. How did you get things, those things onto the tape? Used the separate mix? They were being mic'd and they went into the tape recorder. The tape recorder that I used always had a separate pair of mic inputs. It had a mic on each channel as well as a line on each channel. So you put the stereo house feed in Into. and the mic inputs, you run, what, Jerry's guitar and Phil's bass? Yeah. Just a mic on each one straight yeah. in there. Ah. So you just take that up and monitor to see if those guys were in there inappropriate. Uh, yeah, I just, there was no presence of you didn't pan. You didn't pan those guys, did you? No, I never panned anything. So both Except those were I, had to, I, had to do, I had to do the vocals that way. They were, no, yeah, because the, mix, the mixer... The mixers that I used were old, uh, most of the, you're talking about going back to the old days. Most all the tapes were made uh, using MX-10s. It's an old Ampex mixer, it was a tube type mixer. It had a very wide dynamic range, mm -hmm. it was about 110 dB or something like that. But according to Ron Wickersham, I never measured them. I just liked the way they sounded, so, but each, uh, microphone input had a switch. It could either be both channels or left or right, and there was no there was no pan to it, and a single knob. Paris Choice tapes were tapes made at Fillmore East, and there was a mixing board in there. It was a rather unusual mixing board. I was I'm initially quite skeptical of it, but obviously it worked very well. It was uh, I guess like an op amp. It was a discrete op amp. Or at least it was a single small transistor amplifier. And as far as I know, there's only two amplifiers on the board. One was the amplifier for the house, and the other was the amplifier for the uh, monitors. 
and uh, the passive summing. So I just summed some of them to one bus and some to the other. Maybe there was two. Maybe there was two house summers. But at any rate, I don't really remember the details of the mixer. But at any rate, the house sounded excellent. It was a very good sounding board. It was so simple. Use passive mm -hmm. attenuation of the microphones in front of the amplifier. There were no preamps, no mic preamps, as far as I could tell. And it had a. Well, it had two outputs because somehow I got two outputs because it's stereo tape. I put uh, the two, each side of the PA must have had its own mixer, must have had its own little lamp. And it had uh, an extra output as well as the one that fed the stage. So I took that extra output, put it into the tape recorder. At that time, I was using a stereo Sony. It was a pretty good one, 770. 770? Yeah, there's still one of those in the vault. It's not the one. No, no, but that's some, some kid nicked mine. Yeah. Some kid nicked mine out of uh, out of Alembic when they were on Judas Street. It was never seen again. It was an extremely good one. In fact, most Sony equipment in those days was hissy. That particular one wasn't. I knocked out the uh, RCA inputs and installed uh, quarter-inch phone jacks for inputs on it. So it was rugged enough. And I just ran the um, the other two instruments in separately directly into the tape recorder. And I checked to make sure that they had appropriate balance. And I always used a uh, small oscilloscope in mixing anyway. So what did I, you gain from that? Well, that told me what was going on. I, I, was, I don't like to use of meters. I mean, a meter's handy because it's a quick way to see there's a signal but I prefer to use a stereo uh, I mean a uh, dual tray scope because it lets you see the shape and waveform of the signal as well as being able to see that there is signal there mm -hmm. after a while you can read it because each instrument has its own signature and even when they're laid in together you, you begin to notice that uh, in order for it to sound right, you have to have a certain amount of displacement from the bass, a certain amount of displacement from drums, and you see, although you can't differentiate individual guitars, you, you hear when one or the other instrument is being played, you can see it. So just by looking at it, it's like a fingerprint. It tells you all kinds of stuff. So you got to where you could see from the traces whether your balance was... It tells you a lot about balance. It tells you a lot about... Also, it tells you if there's something wrong instantly. If something's clipping or something's out of phase or if there's anything that's wrong, you can see it immediately. Ah. Even stuff you can't really hear. And stuff that you might have to search for, it might take half a show to find out something's wrong. You can see it. And uh, I uh, attempted to interest other people in it for the last, well, I guess 25 years. Nobody seems to care much about it. They don't seem to either find it interesting or find it useful. Well, now you've had some of your ideas picked up and adopted by other people and followed through, so I guess your batting average is probably pretty good. Well, Were you I already know, I like you certain you things. I like the way things sound. I like the way things work. I always have. I'm not really an engineer, though. Were you already into audio when you first encountered the Grateful Dead? Not really. Actually, about six months or, no, just a few months. I don't remember how many months before I met the Grateful Dead. I had bought a hi-fi and I went around and tried to figure out what was the best hi-fi, and I had a pretty good sized place. It was you living in Berkeley? Yeah. I had a pretty good sized place. It must have been a 55 foot long room, about maybe 35 feet wide. It was a big single room. Uh -huh. And I wound up going around and listening to a lot of stuff, and I decided to buy a Voice of the Theater system, which was about the ugliest hi-fi system you could possibly conceive of. A gigantic. Is that, that was the folded horn job. Or? Well, not really folded. It had a cabinet in the bottom with a. It was a, a front loading horn. It wasn't a back loading horn. It wasn't folded or anything. Uh -huh. It had a 15 inch speaker in it, and uh, it was in a large box about the size of a small fridge, uh -huh. and it had a little horn it mounted up on top. And it was an 800 series horn. And the driver was was maybe four inches in diameter. 
It was a relatively small. So it was a two horn, horn system voice? Yeah, system? one horn on each speaker. One, so a, bo a, a, a bottom and a horn on each side. But it looked like something that someone had rescued up from behind the screen at the local small movie theater or something. It was basically that. But they were, Altec was selling it and hyping it, and it had a nice, tight, rather, um, to me, sounded tight. Of course, later I learned it wasn't. We learned things to make it tighter. But uh, but compared to the average run-of-the-mill speaker, it sounded okay. And it would get loud. I wanted something that would get loud. And um, as it turned out, it wouldn't get loud enough. But uh, when I started out with The Grateful Dead, that PA became the Grateful Dead PA system. You mean your stereo? My your stereo, stereo became the Grateful, became Dead, Grateful PA. Dead PA. Well, describe and Macintosh amp and uh, and well, those big two amps, yeah. To the, yeah to what were you playing? You playing records with it? You have a big turntable? Yeah, I think it was a tape recorder. Mac two forty, forty two channels, forty watts per channel. So you uh, was was your first encounter with the Dead at Muir Beach? Is that right? Well, I had this, I had this pal. His name was Gaylord. It's a black dude. He lives in Berkeley. And he kept wanting me to go down to Keezy's. And said, All these Hell's Angels. And I thought, holy cow, Hell's Angels. This is got to be the most violent bunch of guys I would even heard about. You know, the idea of going down and hanging out with them wasn't really, you know, it didn't sound like it was going to be safe and certainly not fun but he says oh no he says you're really mistaken about these guys He's, you should really do this I said okay Gaylord <laughs> one of these days and he kept after me for months and finally one day uh, he come by in his car and I got in the car and went down there with him and uh, it was a big scene it was all kinds of quote totally different than anything I'd expected and I thought I was into I thought I understood psychedelics and PZ and his bunch proved to me that I didn't understand psychedelics or at least any other ramifications of it. And, what do you uh, mean? Well, what had you been doing with psychedelics? I, it was something that I was doing. It seemed to give me access to my head in some way. Uh-huh. And uh, you know. Why were you more along the lines of the Millbrook guys, more introspective, mm -hmm. or... Uh, I was... I, I don't know. I can't exactly explain. It's not something I've ever been able to put into, into words. I got involved with it because uh, the first time I did it, I realized it opened a door. Uh -huh. And it was a place I wanted to explore. And uh, um, I got involved maybe more deeply than I should have because I I didn't like poisoning myself with unknown things. You just wanted to make sure you could control what you were doing. I wanted to know what I was doing. And uh, um, I guess I'm a good cook, is all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing is, is that um, you only need very tiny amounts, and so even even a even a fairly small amount of it is a lot. So, well, if you can't describe what you were doing with acid before, can you describe what was different about what the Keezy outfit was doing with it? Well, it was magic. It took you into a place that was. Like the descriptions in the uh, in the books by uh, the Rosicrucians and uh, and the Freemasons, and it made sense of all the different uh, occult things that I'd read. It was it was the introduction to magic. It was it was a a pathway to another place, and it seemed to um, it seemed to give you access to mental powers that were. Uh, written about and talked about both amongst the Hindus and amongst the ancient uh, uh, alchemists and magicians and uh, direct, seemed to go direct, give you the access to those things. It was like a tool, like a tool to work on the consciousness. Um, although the material always gave me great visions, incredible visions. I'm sure that it's the root source of the art that I do, even today. I'm sure it was the root source of my ability to manipulate sound, which I looked at as an art form. I never looked at myself as an engineer mm -hmm. anymore, and I looked at myself as a, as a chemist or anything else, not a scientist. 
of scientific background but because I'm interested in everything mm-hmm. and science is a, just a way of describing the physical universe and uh, alchemy and the occult is just a way of describing the non-physical universe and I was interested in both aspects and art is a way of creating something uh, yourself as a man which can say something about either the physical the non-physical or both uh, yeah. I was going to say that, that somewhere along the line there's a bridge between the two oh, for yeah. comparing and contrasting those things um, well I like the, I like spatiality one of the earliest things that happened to me with regards to psychedelics was that the universe became even more three dimensional it seemed to have more dimension and depth and space to it colors and things seem very intense and um, at one of the acid tests I I don't know which one it was it might have been Watts actually it was a very strange experience where all of a sudden um, I was looking at sound coming out of the speakers this happened on several occasions it also happened in the house that we were standing in Watts where I actually saw sound coming out of the speakers I just wanted to have that happen. What's that called? Kinesthesia. Yeah, synesthesia. Yeah. Synesthesia. I've, I've always read about that and I always wanted to hear colors. I've never talked to anyone else who's actually had that experience, but I actually had that experience. And it was funny because um, I'm looking at this sound, you know, I'm, I'm really out there and all kinds of other things are going on and I was thinking, you know, that doesn't look the way I thought sound. <laughs> no. And I thought, uh uh-uh, but... You see, it was very funny because uh, the lady that I was with in those days was was quite direct. You know, it was her name was Melissa. And quite she direct. Was, oh, very direct about everything, right? Uh-huh. So whenever we would get high, this is long before I met the dead, right? But whenever we get high, and things just start getting really weird, she would insist on dealing with them as though they were real, not a hallucination, not something that the drug was doing, but this is reality and forced me to deal with it. So I never got into that space that a lot of people get into where they say, oh, it's the drug that's doing this. This is a hallucination. This is a non-real effect which is being produced by a chemical which is in my brain. I had to deal with it as though this was the absolute concrete everyday reality now. Deal with it, right? And that was interesting because that's different it's different that way see Mm -hmm. you 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 do a whole different you have a whole different set right it's like the difference between sitting in a um driving a car in a video game or getting in a car right Mm -hmm. and she wouldn't let me drive the video game car (laughs) she made (laughs) me deal with it deal with it on the street now and so when i got to this point in the acid test when i saw sound coming out of the speakers, I was totally programmed to accept whatever I saw as being real, more real perhaps than my everyday life, which was which I had come to uh, believe was restricted consciousness, where I actually saw less or felt less and perceived less. Mm-hmm. And so the telepathy and the, the um, almost uh, telekinetic kind of things that go on that you experience when you're on acid, I accept it as real. But they're actually there. And they, there are probably people, I thought, they can do this. So the, the idea of Yuri Geller bending the spoon or doing things like that, that never amazed me. That just seemed like, oh, he's figured out how to do it without having to have an amplifier in his system. Mm-hmm. He's got it straight. People who are telekinetic, people who read minds, people who have uh, precognitive visions, oh, well, they've just learned how to do it without having to think. And you read all throughout the Hindu um, stuff you read about uh, fakirs who are capable of doing things uh, translating stuff uh, levitating their bodies and uh, manifesting uh, things in the physical world and stuff like that and people think well it's it's it's, uh, sleight of hand or it's hokum I don't think it is I think it is that through their meditative states they've managed to kick whatever storehouse of whatever it is in your brain that the acid kicks only they wanted to do it without acid which is probably better but sometimes it takes a lifetime and not all of them make it 
out of maybe 10,000 people who follow the yogic practices, maybe three or four get to the state of becoming that kind of a high mask. I would imagine it would have some relevance that you came from a culture that doesn't really uh, honor that kind of stuff very much or, or pay much attention to it at all, right? Well, you mean the physical orientation? Well, I mean, the Western scientism and, uh, well, you know, and Western, what passes for spiritualism among the, the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant types is pretty... Uh, well, it's more than just Protestant. Our, well, yeah, our, the whole Judeo-Christian thing is, is yeah. pretty anti-mystical. Judeo-Christian Islamic is the soldier's religion. It was, the, yeah, from ancient day. We're finding that out in a major way right now, aren't we? Hey, the Romans had so much trouble with the Jews that they had to run them out, they had to disperse them. They, they never stopped fighting them. Mm -hmm. And that was 70 AD. And uh, when uh, was it Constantine wanted to have better control over his uh, troops, his soldiers, and his, and his subjects, he uh, produced Christianity, which is maybe an odd way of looking at it, but he called a whole bunch of Christian representatives together and said agree upon something. And he may have done even more than that, I don't know, because you know what we hear about it now is what the church preserved to tell people what it was. I mean, all we know is that there were about um, 7,000 written documents at, at that point, which was about, it was in the 4th century, and most of them were destroyed. And that most of the writings that became canonized were, the, the, were primarily the writings of a soldier, which was Saul of Tarsus. Yeah. And so um, certainly uh, everyone recognizes the warlike nature of Islam. So we have, we have the three major uh, religions that are connected with the materialistic culture in the Western world and science, which was, a, which was the um, remaining investigative urge remaining from alchemy, which was a philosophy about the world, the life, universe, God, what it is, um, because of the belief that the practicers, practicing, uh, the practitioners of alchemy had that they could understand uh, the universe by manipulating the physical things, which then became chemistry and physics and so forth that by understanding the rules by which the universe was put together, they could extrapolate these rules into the unseen universe and into other things. Because alchemy teaches that as above, so below. That if you understand something that works on one level, you can understand it on another. And a common example of this is the similarity, the structure of the, of the uh, solar system and, and uh, the structure of an atom, which That's can be represented or thought about in a similar fashion. We seem to be coming back to that now as this chaos theory emerges and fractals and stuff as a way of explaining Well, I always thought of it like alchemy itself was like a seed because it embodied very basic concepts, usually described as the seven principles. And that from that seed, when it was planted, grew basically two, actually grew several, but basically two trees, or two plants. One plant we call chemistry, the other plant we call physics. There was also biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the different disciplines. But two basic disciplines, which are physics and chemistry, which are two distinct ways of looking at the physical interactions of objects in the universe. One, the mechanical interactions, one, the chemical interactions, the reactive interactions. But as these sciences developed, and as they began to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the structure, of matter. All of a sudden, it wasn't solid anymore. It became vibrational, became energetic, became fields. And uh, things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says you can't describe everything about something up here. And all kinds of different things all start, it starts to get very strange and turns back into just vibration. You deal with it as vibration. So you might say that the, the plants grew up and they flowered, the flowering being modern technology. And then they set seed, and the seed is out to be complete back again. Right. Same thing. That's just the way. That's the way I look at it. That's cool. The individual plants are highly specialized, but when they come back together, they produce a unified concept once again. So it's it's more cyclical than linear, and we like that. 
Yeah, yeah. well, it's just, yeah, well, everything is cyclical. <laughs> if we go back to alchemy. There we go. Good, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. The so, whole concept of the universe as a conscious entity, which is dreaming it all up, makes it easy to understand such things as telepathy. And how, why astrology? Well, astrology is a description of how the cyclical things that you can see in the recurring uh, angles and relationships of the planets can be used to connect or to relate to the uh, the nature of events on the earth. And after hundreds of thousands of years of watching it, people evolved as, oh yeah, well, when this happens, well, things are going to likely to do this. And uh, over a long period of time, a lot of observation, uh, we have come up with this thing. But you can't scientifically measure it. There's no direct connection. The only connection is that everything's being thought up in the mind of the being that's thinking everything up at the same time, according to the rules. The rules be what we describe as the laws of nature and other things. And we know some of them. We don't know all of them. Were you thinking Mostly about this simple. stuff when you started taking acid? Were you already thinking about this stuff when it... Or? I, it's hard for me to say, you know, because um, I don't, I'm not a, a, a meticulously scientific kind of a guy who kept journals or anything else about the way in which I thought about stuff. And so as my uh, viewpoint and my philosophy evolves, it replaces the philosophy that was there. And in some cases, I can remember what I thought before. But mostly I found out that I can hold a, an idea, a concept, and then I'll suddenly discover that, it, that it's wrong, that it's fallacious, or that I'm, mis that I'm mistaken. I immediately discard that and replace it with the new information. Well, it's like taping over a tape. Right. I don't necessarily <laughs> want to go back and remember what a fool I was. Right, right, so right. I, 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 I think it out. You know, I, sure. I think that's a, a, the sign of an adaptive mind. Yeah, sure. well, it, then it, I'm who like knows? On that Maybe you've got an infinite amount of tape in your brain no, that you can record. No, that's a Maybe great note. No, I don't really know. I dig that. That yeah. means that you're not too married to the old ideas no. and it's okay to let them go. That's fine. Well, I used to have a tremendously retentive memory on Never bothered to write oh, down phone numbers. You probably have plenty. So you went to uh, Kesey's acid scene and went out of Kesey's house, and um, I found it very interesting. And you know, interesting enough, so that I went down several more times. And one of the times when I was and I had heard about this band, which was the first time I went down there. They were calling the Warlocks, and I didn't pay that much attention to it, except they were obviously all excited about it. And the next time Maybe I went, yeah, 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 yeah. Next time I went down, someone came in and said they just picked the name Grateful Dead. I think it was Mountain Girl uh -huh. came in and said that. Said, oh, they they've got a new name. They they named themselves. They couldn't be the Warlocks because some band in Florida had that thing. Which band? I, Never heard of it. No, after that, I don't know whether they really existed or not. But that Lynch was told me the same thing. He said he was looking through records in the store and saw something about the Warlocks. And he said, and he went back and said, hey, guys, we can't be the Warlocks. But he said he never found that record again. And then I found out that Lou Reed was in a band called the Warlocks before he was in the Velvet Underground. Oh, yeah. So it's possible that was the Warlocks or could be there was, you know, the most story of the I heard was a band that was in Florida uh -huh. or something. Well, no, okay. that was anyway. his, his So they changed their name to Grateful Dead. And, uh, I didn't actually see them play until I went to the Mirror Beach Acid Test, and that's when I saw them play. Whether or not I ran into uh, Garcia or someone else at Kesey's during those visits, I don't really recall. The only person other than uh, Mountain Girl and, uh, and uh, George Walker, uh, maybe Paige and uh, Kesey himself, was maybe Terry the Tramp one of the angels I remembered him mm -hmm. but I don't remember whether Kesey was there there was several times it was a big party of people all you know going in every direction at once very difficult to to make a whole lot of sense out of it because it was totally different than the scene that I was in which is pretty relatively quiet up to that point was going to get it Kesey was the kind of guy that reached out took your knobs and tweaked them all the way to 10 all of them <laughs> and the whole scene was was running at 10 all the time you know it was like a real um it was almost as uh 
it was almost as sudden and as different as discovering psychedelics themselves for the first time. Well, I would venture to say that Another the level. social aspect of it, I mean, the collective acid experience probably was part of the eye opener there, right? Oh, then, you know, everybody was tripping together and uh, in on the joke kind of together or in on the multiple jokes or whatever. I think it was more than that. Yeah. It was like they did specific things. They did specific things. They made specific sounds. They did specific stuff. Loop tape machines together. Do delays and get um, reverberation, which re the sound reinforcing itself. And there's a, there's a certain persistence, like when you're really high, you move your hand, and you get a smear. Well, there's also other kinds of persistence. And they reinforced all these things. How they how they came upon them? It, it seemed as though they had rediscovered something from uh, ancient ways and ancient times. A lot of the music that's used in shamanic rituals does the same thing, which we discovered later, but this was totally came up in isolation. None of these people in the Gizi scene had any roots in the shamanistic rituals at all. That was the other group of people that I'd run into every so often that were more into those things. You know, the, the Millbrook guys and the rest of those guys that, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, Janninger and... Uh, all those guys, they were more into that. They, whether they actually got into the rituals or not, because I just had some contacts with them, you know, take a few trips with them and that sort of thing, but not, didn't follow that line, didn't go down, never went to a, a, an Indian peyote meeting, although I always had a desire to do so, and I never went to a, to a uh, uh, curandero in Mexico with the mushrooms or any of those things. So I've never actually seen it, but from the best that I can figure out, all those rituals contained a lot of the elements which the pranksters discovered or rediscovered or well, invented actually, or that's something. Probably not that much of a surprise though. I mean I mean there, there's I certainly have the belief that a lot of that stuff is in here. It's well, in it must genetic. be. It must I mean, be. A lot it must of be. a lot of you know, the reason a lot of this stuff it, is we get that recognition from it is that some of it emanates from our own neurology and DNA. It's You've read this one, haven't you? Read you? This no, one? I haven't. Did you know about that book? It's really interesting. Intoxication. It's called intoxication. Ronald Siegel. He's um, studying new research on the craving for altered states. Oh, that's the fourth drive theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been hearing about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, it it seems obvious. In fact, examination. Ex uh, there's a very interesting plant on this plant. I mean, there's several very interesting plants, but one of the more interesting ones is cannabis. Cannabis is a single plant, as far as I can see. All the all the talking about cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, cannabis ruderalis, I think is, is rubbish. I think there's one plant, cannabis, whatever you want to call it. And that all these interbreed completely. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different cultivars. Just as if you looked at a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, you might think they were totally different kinds of animals, right? But obviously, and yet they can. Right. Yeah, obviously they're not. They're just cultivars, and so there's a lot of different variants and variations amongst cannabis. But it's a single plant, and it it seems to produce a, a substance which has an effect on meat eaters. Does not seem to have much of any effect on herbivores. Why does that sit on my vegetarian pothead friends? Yeah, wait well, a minute. Well, uh, let's not get... Yeah, people aren't vegetarians. Anybody. People are carnivores. Okay. People are almost. Oh, they're not oh, quite, almost, but not quite on, obligate to eat. Yeah. Okay. If, uh, if you eat vegetables, you're called a vegetarian. If you're an animal that's adapted to a, a diet of plants, you're a herbivore. That's why it's a better term. Herbivores do not seem to get... Oh, right. Intoxicated like, by cannabis. I got you. Okay. Like the air. They seem to be... So it's our chemistry, not our choice of food that calls us... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Where our bodies are, are highly adapted to a diet of meat, but we retain some of our monkey roots so that we can survive between periods of no game. Most predatory animals are totally controlled by accessibility to game, hmm. like a cat. The cat cannot find prey. The cat will die. The cat, of course, is will it eat won't, anything won't from, from bugs on up, anything that'll move, it'll eat. But sometimes men have occupied areas in the planet and places where there isn't any other kind of, of food, and if there's no game, there's nothing to eat. He dies, like Eskimo in that way. But he seems to have retained a lot of that vegetable processing machinery 
left over from the time when he was swinging from branch to branch. But that's so far back that maybe five million years or so, so far back that we only have the most rudimentary systems remaining from that. Result is uh, when we eat a lot of vegetable matter, we get uh, we don't live very long, die at about 60 or 70, and your body becomes heavy rather rapidly, your teeth rot away, things like that. All kinds of problems occur. If you eat a, uh, a mixed diet, foods all taken in at one meal, you're more likely to suffer more extensively, more rapidly than if you eat them at separate meals. But basically, uh, our, our bodies are capable of digesting vegetation, which is very useful. It gives us a survival edge, which is why we have it, and why we're lucky we have it. But you're again, it, aren't you? I don't think it's good for you. I don't see any point in it. What? Vegetarian? <laughs> well, let's not get on that. We're not doing it. I'm diet. just saying, <laughs> we're talking about, the, <laughs> about <laughs> cannabis. Right. Okay. Okay. And it's, Animals, it's, uh, you can take a... a you take a, a, a pot plant, right? It might be 40 pounds mm -hmm. wet weight. And you yeah. take an ounce of that and feed it to the dog, and the dog gets a stone he can't stand up. Yeah, right. I mean, can't stand up. On the yes, other hand, yeah. a deer can walk up to the plant and eat half the plant. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. And really? nothing will happen. Oh. How do you know? He can eat the equivalent of about, of about a pound of tops off that plant. One ounce of which would incapacitate the dog, and and the deer will walk over to the next plant and eat something. So the deer just doesn't have the chemistry to process it. That's and funny. They the, found what we would call a benefit of it. Right, yeah. right. There was a, a a doctor. Don't remember his name. If it's important, to you, it could be looked up. Did extensive research uh, around 1860 in India on uh, the effects of cannabis because it was a big thing. That it's traditional traditional herb used to in large quantities in India. Mm -hmm. And he found that when he fed experimental amounts of it to various animals, he determined that there was virtually no effect observable in a in a herbivorous animals. And he I think he tried goats and rabbits and uh sheep and uh mm -hmm. some kind of a deer or antelope something like that, it was a series of them. Mm -hmm. And yet all the carnivorous animals, like cats and dogs and people, seem to get a strong effect from it. Interesting. And, uh... That explains my affinity for it. It could be. <laughs> all I know is that insects that eat plants don't seem to be repelled by it. It doesn't seem to bother them. Mm -hmm. uh, cabbage worms will eat it up like crazy. So why And your... The point of this is, is that this plant... Oh, another thing is that a plant growing out in the wild is usually very weak. So they say wild wild grass is no good. Right? It's it's trash. But when people grow it, it keeps getting stronger and stronger. Uh I just I'm of the I'm I feel very strongly about the the um, telepathic nature of plants, which has been demonstrated by various people. It was a, a lot of publicity about fifteen or twenty years ago by a guy named Jim Baxter who put uh, electrodes, like a lie detector electrodes, galvanic response meter onto plants and found that you could threaten them with fire or even think about threatening them with fire and they'd react. Sure. And he found that this, this reaction was, was he found it on every plant he tried it on. And uh, my own experiences uh, with psychedelics lead me to believe that plants are highly conscious mm -hmm. entities, very conscious, and they're not troubled by having an ego because they don't have to make a decision. The ego is a restricted kind of consciousness that an animal has to have in order to be able to sort out and just accept some input so as to make a decision to do something. Because if you have all inputs all the time, you're, you're, you're almost unable to make a decision. It's too much data, too much stuff. You're swamped. Plant doesn't have to make much in the way of decisions. It's roots where its seed fell. That's it. But it does express itself in various ways. One of the more interesting ways plants express their consciousness is an example is the uh, orchid that resembles a certain bee. So completely does it resemble a female bee that the males try to mate with it. It smells like the bee and it looks like the bee. And it's shaped in such a way that when the male grabs it, he, his head it pushes up against the pollinia, which is the, the pollen the balls that stick to him. 
and he attempts to make. So and the I've, seen, I've seen I've seen films of the of the of the uh, mm -hmm. male getting it on with the flower, and he leaves that flower goes to another one. and goes to another one, tries again, and then and he leaves the polenia that he picked right. up from the first one, picks up a pair from that one, uh -huh. and he might go on, he might actually hump a, a dozen <laughs> flowers in turn, right? Yeah. This, may, re that, this right? may reduce his ability to mate with the proper female of his species, but it pollinates the, the flower, does nice the flower nice thing. Thinking. And the and there's no and yet flowers have no eyes. Orchids have no eyes. Well, no. To imitate the female, the or, the plant has to know what it looks like. So the plant knows what it looks like. Not only does it know what it looks like, it has to know it has to understand the practices that that animal undergoes in order to put itself in there to take advantage of that. No, I think you're construing consciousness rather broadly here. Right? Of course. <laughs> why should you, why should you well, restrict the definition of consciousness? I, 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 okay. Well, no, I, I'm open to this. Now. My experiences with, with plants through psychedelics lead me to believe that every, that it's an extension of my alchemical belief. In alchemy the basic tenet of alchemy is that the universe is mental, that there is a being which is nothing but mind, pure mind, and that all that we experience is the creation of this mind according to the rules which are the laws of nature, the rules of physics, the rules of chemistry, so forth, attraction, repulsion, polarity, all of these things are it's still mental. And since everything in the universe is is mental because it, it it is the mentation of the being which is mental. Everything has to use the same kind of mentality. As in other words, all consciousness relates and is the same. So there's, there shouldn't be any trouble being able to communicate mentally with any other living thing, whether it be another man, a dog, a plant, or anything else, because all thought has to be of the same nature because it's all manifested by it. The way in which we manipulate uh, sound waves in our language, the way in which we put this language together is more expressive of us and of our culture. It's, as we're beginning to understand, other animals use sound to communicate with in much more complicated fashions than we have previously thought. Uh, dolphins, for instance, and even uh, monkeys, and perhaps even other animals. There's always been people like Indians who would say that they could talk to the animals that they knew what the animal was saying when it made a certain noise. That this, that different sounds and different movements and positions and and so forth can be used to communicate. Certainly, they've been very uh, successful in teaching American Sign Language to chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. So I see no reason why one should one should doubt that behind that all is a common modality of thought. So regardless of the universal. continuum, then from uh, yeah. rocks to uh, yeah. Right. Gods. Yeah. Which is why I think people are attracted to uh, crystals, because a crystalline substance has a highly ordered electronic behavior, and uh, the behavior of thought and mentation has electronic nature to it. There's a flow of electrons. Hmm. And in fact, one of the thing, very interesting things. This is very interesting too. As a little side uh, about how psychedelics affect you and how you interact with not only consciousness but we found that some of the psychedelics seem to affect our way, our, our ability to interact with uh, inanimate equipment. Really? Specifically. When someone at a, at a show or when in a room where someone was playing music was to uh, take some DMT, which is a rather, a rather powerful psychedelic, the music would immediately become louder and more strident and... No, the yeah. other people would notice that. Absolutely, everybody. Oh, ev everybody. It just does. It, it does a thing, it, and it has a certain tonality to it, a certain quality to it, which is very distinctive. So we decided that we decided we none of us could. We generally we'd all do it, right? And we thought, oh well, that's just one of those things. But then I got on that back to that thing that that I'd learned from Melissa is that don't assume that this is an illusion caused by the substance. Mm -hmm. Believe it's real, so I said, "Hey, I believe this is real." Well, what we one thing we noticed was that the, the tubes would get red hot and burn out half the time, and it would tear the voice calls out of the speakers. And yet we couldn't make it do that ordinarily. 
So I actually started making some measurements. We, we measure the amplifier at its maximum output with a musician doing everything he could to get the max out of it. Then somebody would smoke the, the DMT, but not everybody, just one person. Mm -hmm. And we'd measure it, and it would go up 6 dB, huh. which is... That's so fast quadruple power, right? Right. It huh. would go up more than that sometimes. And yet we were absolutely sure that we were at the limit. It would be something like 127 max. Somebody would smoke it, it would go to 132. And it would literally t melt the voice coils. Where did the power come from? The tubes couldn't handle it. They would often uh, burn up. They'd often get hot, and, and the, the internal structures in the tubes would melt. Where'd it come from, right? How, how was, what was going on? I evolved a, a little theory. I don't know, because obviously this is something that you could do some scientific research on. It would be well worthy of it. Because the idea being that if you could find, if there was some type of circuit that was more sensitive to it than others, you could measure different circuit sensitivity then you could optimize that. And perhaps you might even be able to develop a circuit that had that property to such an extent that a person could, could effect it without having to take the psychedelic. What, and it wouldn't matter what any, any interaction of any kind that you could initiate with your mind would enable you to build something that would directly control a machine. Because the computer could interpret it anything mm -hmm. that once you could get into it that way, you see. Which, was, which is what we need. We need a way of controlling machines directly. I mean, so it's like an example of, the, of many of the uh, opportunities that psychedelics present to man, which are being completely thrown away because of the irrational approach that people are taking to them. Totally. Oh, this, is, I mean, uh, this, this is real. The amplifier changes, the sound changes, the music also changes. So whether that's, whether that's a psychic effect on the amplifier on the musician, I don't know. But no matter what effect person A's uh, taking of the psychedelic could have on person B who's playing the, the guitar, there's no way that person B could make that guitar get louder by, by himself. No. The guitar, because everything got louder, everything got stronger, it became more strident, it changed in quality, but it also became much louder. Well, there's that a, came from a direct effect on maybe the electrons flowing in the equipment, which is the thing about the organization of electrons and the similarity or the, the very close association of the quality of consciousness or thought to electronic motion and matter. Because um, certainly the most elaborately constrained electron would be the one that's associated with DNA, yeah, which I is so. billions of atoms sometimes, you know, yeah. an enormous number of atoms all of which arranged in a very precise way would order the motion of electrons in a very, very precise and specific and special way. Which would have frequency and, and resonances and stuff that we... Are you, I don't know, because you well, see, I'm you not a scientist. It, I'm no, but if you take it you, as a, so below, then we yeah, can yeah, assume yeah. that there would be ripples and, and har harmonics of that all the way up into perceivable uh, realms, right? Probably, probably, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly, the, some kinds of telepathy actually did it, had actually involved. Picked a great time to run over the headset with my chair. <laughs> it's Dead to the World. My name is David Gans, and you're listening to an interview uh, with the late and de decidedly great Owsley Stanley, also known as Bear, a great, great hero to many of us in um, the music world and the psychedelic hippie world and uh, the world of audio because he... Um, did many, many, many good things for all of us, spiritually and materially and in the world of audio. Uh, I'm just going to go on. I'll tell you a little bit more uh, after this. Let's, let's listen to another segment to get us through to the top of the hour. Did you like the music when you first heard The Grateful Dead in your beach? That scared me. How so? Oh, it just seemed frightening. They seemed to have... All of that seemed to have a connection to a very, a very scary, and possibly dangerous aspect of reality. To me, somebody told me that you pushed a chair around that building. Yeah, yeah I was pushing made a, chair. a lot of noise. Made some place. noise. Uh, everything was making noise. It was a very noisy used. place. Probably well, it seemed like it. Yeah. Tell me more. I'd like know. to hear your side of that story. <laughs> I don't know. I remember. The, I remember pushing the, uh, the chair around, and I remember all kinds of different things. I remember. All kinds of noises and sounds and things. The pranksters would make these noises, 
and the noises would seem to get inside your nervous system and um, as if there was some type of a plug or something in your head it would get in there and scrape away uh, some uh, kind of a cap so it would make the uh, connection available to be plugged into something uh-huh. a psychic cable for the insulation yeah you might say right yeah, like a hymen perhaps <laughs> <laughs> mental hymen and then it would and then you would the the connection would be made and all the people would be linked up and start sharing thoughts and images and ideas and it was like not just thoughts but little little thoughts and concepts but uh, you you saw like a patchwork of images and you felt a patchwork of body sensations and everything else it was very definitely a, a, a gestalt multiple mind kind of phenomenon polymorphous synesthesia uh, could be yeah that might be a good term that would that would certainly describe it do you think well obviously other people felt this too but that was the first time anything like that had actually happened to me it was really it was uh, very weird and scary was that was that what those guys were working on do you think I mean had that do you think that nobody was, would talk about it they just did it did it uh-huh. you didn't talk about it you just did it whatever you had done each the all from all of whatever was going on in that scene for what a year or two before I ran uh-huh. into it they had slowly but surely built this up and whether it was instinctive or what it may be very well be instinctive maybe that the psychedelics all of the psychedelic plants seemed to have a very ancient and direct relationship with man uh-huh. as I was uh, att- attempting to get into that the the cannabis plant seems to pr- specifically produce its resin to intoxicate man in a pleasant fashion so that the man is now interested in the plant so just as the orchid duplicates the female bee that particular orchid to achieve its propagation of its kind this plant has latched on to producing a substance that is so pleasant for the man that he will care for the plant, propagate it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, its association with man is so strong that the Chinese symbol for pot shows a house with a plant growing under the eave. And it's considered a composter or, or um, compost heap grower everywhere. And it grows best where it's richest and well supplied with it. And when it grows off as a weed in the woods, it's n- never particularly potent. And if it's derived for, the, in, in, for instance all the Mexican stuff and some of the Mexican pot big sativa plant like really can grow really tall 16 20 feet mm-hmm. grows in the same style as the as the hemp that's grown for for fiber obviously is derived from the early hemp plantations established in Mexico by the Spanish settlers because you got to have hemp because it makes rope, it makes twine, it makes cloth. Your your ships have got to have it. Uh, so we, one of the first things that any colonial group, in fact, I wouldn't have been surprised. I don't know this to be true for a fact, but it wouldn't have surprised me if uh, hemp seeds and stuff weren't always carried on ships for that reason. Because suppose you got shipwrecked, you at least you had a chance of making to yourself it. some rope if you could. Yeah, you could. You had the chance if you had the hemp seed. So hemp, at least, was a very early cultivar, wherever. And uh, it just went on off into the woods with the, with the Indians. And over the last 400 years or so, they simply selected it to do what they wanted. And it happens that what they wanted was <laughs> get very stoned. So the, the grass is extremely strong. And it's funny because it's the, the, the nature of the, of the high is such that if the seeds are allowed to go for several years before they're planted, they become weaker and weaker and weaker. Even though it'll still grow a plant, at the end you wind up back with a plant that doesn't do anything. Really? Yeah. If, if the seeds are kept high and dry long enough, they'll lose their... they lose their... they lose, lose their, 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 their high. Psychedelic effect. Yeah, they lose the high. they lose the psychedelic effect. They'll yeah. still grow a plant. The plant looks the same, makes us, does everything it's supposed to do. Tends to be tends to become hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite, I think, was the original form of the plant. The separation of male and female is something that man has imposed on it, and the uh, uh, exemplification of the psychedelic properties of the intoxicating resin is something that man selects for. And the plant knows. The plant is conscious of the man, and it's very interesting because old-time growers 
even though they grow different kinds of strains, they have a lot of different strains in the, that they grow. A very similar hive. Hmm. They're all their cross. Everything they everything grow. that they grow, you can tell after a while. You can s smoke a pot from a from a long time grower and tell who it is. It becomes very distinctive. Because the plant is doing something for the guy who's caring for it. It's just a very, very tight relationship. And this relationship must also exist between man and the cactus, mm -hmm. between man and the, and the fungus. All of the plants which we know, the shamanistic plants, which are plants of psychedelic properties, all, I believe, do it to get the man high, not as a protection against something. Because there's other things besides man that eat peyote. And there's a lot of insects that eat them up. There's a, lots of things that eat up pot plants. Lots of things eat up uh, mushrooms, even deadly poisonous mushrooms are eaten quite frequently by insects and things. So any specific so-called defense seems to be an illusion. It has not necessarily that function. Just because there's a substance in there, that doesn't mean for instance, these are uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms are not particularly deadly to anything that eat them, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, some animals seek them out after they've eaten them the first time. So they certainly you know wouldn't be, uh, a lot of out. animals will seek them seek out. Them out. Because they yeah. get high from them. Yeah, because they get high from them. Well, and then, getting then. high on psychedelic, getting high on psychedelic is not something that just man's attracted to. Is one of the things this book points right. out. Right. Is there's a, a lots of animals, almost all animals when exposed to a consciousness changing substance will seek like, it. That's yeah. right. You're listening to an interview recorded uh, in January of 1991 with the late, great Owsley Stanley. And you're listening to it on KPFA 94.1 Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, or online at kpfa.org. The name of the program is Dead to the World, and it will continue after this pre-recorded announcement. Golden Gate University is proud to host a benefit featuring California Senator Mark Leno and Assemblywoman Speaker Pro Tempore Fiona Ma at Dignity in Schools Beyond the Numbers of the School to Prison Pipeline, Community Conversations. California faces a crisis of students not completing high school, and a large portion of students who do not finish high school will end up incarcerated. The California Dropout Research Project found that a 50% reduction in dropouts statewide could save $12 billion annually. In an effort to develop community solutions to combat the systemic problems of a large school-to-prison pipeline, California Center Leno will meet with Bay Area students, parents, and community members on Saturday, April 16th, 9 a.m. to 12 noon at Golden Gate University, 536 Mission Street in San Francisco. Donations will be accepted at the event. For questions, please call 1-800-448-4968. And once again, I'll tell you, you are tuned to KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or 88.1 KFCF in Fresno or online at kpfa.org. My name is David Gans. The program is Dead to the World. It is ordinarily a music program, but tonight we are listening to uh, an interview with um, a true legend of American uh, Earth people culture, Owsley Stanley, also known as Bear. He's the namesake of Bear's Choice, an album of uh, Grateful Dead music. He recorded the Grateful Dead uh, because he was their sound man. He was doing monitors, as you'll hear. He he started with the Grateful Dead in 1966 uh, and brought his huge home stereo system down to the Fillmore and wound up being the Grateful Dead sound man for many years and also uh, inspired and designed many, many, many audio tools that have made all of us able to hear music better. The famous legendary wall of sound system that the Grateful Dead toured with in 1974 was a huge breakthrough and is a little too expensive to actually use for too long, but it was an amazing tool. Um, and uh, many, many other ideas, as you'll hear. Plus, the guy just had an incredible mind, as you've heard, and as many callers have uh, called in to say, you know, they didn't, they wanted to know who I was talking to here. Again, it was Owsley Stanley who died on March 13th in a car crash in Australia, where he'd been living for the last 20 years or so, um, at the age of 76, and um, 
I consider it a great personal loss. I, I knew him and hung out with him some and uh, got to benefit from his great wisdom and his crazy mind many times. And it's a great loss to the Grateful Dead and lots of other musicians and uh, people in the audio community who worked with him and knew him. We'll get back to some more of the interview with Owsley in a few minutes. First, I want to tell you a couple things. First of all, I have some tickets to give away to screenings of the Grateful Dead movie. This is happening nationwide on April 20th. Consult your local listings for theaters. I've been given tickets to several theaters here in the Bay Area. The uh, Bay Street 16 in Emeryville, Pleasant Hill downtown 16 in Pleasant Hill, Walnut Creek in uh, Walnut Creek 14 on Locust Street in Walnut Creek, Century Theaters in Hayward on Foothill Boulevard, the Black Hawk in Danville, and the Hacienda Crossings 20 in Dublin, California. If you are near any of those movie theaters and you'd like a pair of free passes to see the Grateful Dead movie on April 20th, call me at 510 510- Eight four eight four four two five, and I will take your mailing address and send you a pair of passes. Um, I, I won't get to all of them this evening. I will give away some more passes next week. But once again, I want you to understand the Grateful Dead movie and terrific film document is playing in theaters. On April 20th from coast to coast, and it's going to be uh, accompanied by interviews that I believe were shot for the movie back in 1974 with Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir. These have never been seen before except, I guess, the excerpts that are in the film. Uh, And once again, the theaters are in Emeryville, Pleasant Hill, Hayward, Walnut Creek, Dublin, and Danville. I'm guessing these are the theaters that they, the K Fog ticket giveaway didn't cover. So if you're on the line already, hold on. As soon as I restart the Bear interview, I will start answering calls and taking down uh, mailing addresses. If you don't get through, be patient. You might also send me email. This might also help. Send me email, david at gdhour.com, g-d-h-o-u-r.com. If you'd like to go to one of those screenings, send me your mailing address to that email address, and I will take phone calls and emails until I have given away all of the free passes to the screenings of the Grateful Dead movie. Now, before we get on... I want to tell you about some events. There's a benefit for the Ashkenaz happening at the Ashkenaz this Friday, April Fool's Day. It's a community benefit. Night of the Fools with Sean Hodge and High Beat, JB3 and Mana Maddie and the Family. Amazingly rockin' bay bands. The first monthly community benefit night to raise money for Ashkenaz. Now I completely support that cause. I was on the board of trustees of the Ashkenaz uh, at when we converted it to a non-profit to keep it alive following the murder of founder David Nadell. So it sounds like a lot of great music and it's a benefit for the Ashkenaz. Night of the Fools with Sean Hodge and High Beat, JB3 and Mana Maddie and the family. That's this Friday, April Fool's Day. The Thugs Tribal Hippie Underground Zone are doing their monthly dead dance next Wednesday, April 6th at the Hot Monk Tavern in Sebastopol. And they will have a very special guest, the wonderful Banana Lowell Levenger, is going to sit in with them and do some songs with thugs. Stark Star Orchestra is coming to town Thursday through Saturday, April 7th, 8th, and 9th at the Great American Music Hall. The Mother Hips with Nikki Bloom opening Friday. Uh, April 8th at the Crystal Bay Cas- Casino in Crystal Bay, Nevada, and Saturday, April 9th at the Hop Monk Tavern in Sebastopol. Come in, Deb. It's okay. Daryl Anger and Scott Law will be performing on uh, Saturday, April 9th at the Petaluma Church Concerts at the First Church of Christ Scientist at B and 6th in downtown Petaluma. Karen Armstrong is going to do a live recording session at the Freight and Salvage with the great, great Joe Craven and Joshua Zucker joining her. Karen Armstrong at the Freight and Salvage on Sunday, April 10th. And I think well, that's probably enough listings for the near future here. Um, once again, I'm going to give away tickets to the Grateful Dead movie April 20th from coast to coast. It'll be showing in screens everywhere. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it 
on the big screen with big sound with a big crowd again. That's going to be great. And let's get back to the interview with Owsley Stanley, recorded on uh, in January of 1991. We were on the beach. Okay. The music scared you. That's right. I thought, these guys are fantastic. But it was scary. The music was scary. It pushed me to the edge, and I thought, the, the sound of Gar- Garcia's guitar was like the claws of a, of a tiger. It was like, they were like, it was like... Dangerously scary, very, very to the point. You can't talk about this stuff. I thought to myself, one of these they, these guys are going to be greater than the Beatles someday. It wasn't as though I just thought that. It was almost like a revelation, like looking into the future. I just instinctively knew that there was something they were gonna make like a that. Big time. Yeah, that was like <laughs> not not even not even that I actually thought about it in those terms, but I did think these guys are going to be greater than the Beatles. Hmm. It made it that... It, that, was this, that was the way the thought, that was the way I recognized the thought I was having about it. I mean, that was the terms in which it, that I sub-vocalized uh-huh. that to myself. And um, in a way they are, because the, Beatle was, uh, the Beatles were a phenomenon that was the phenomenon of the universal attractiveness of their music. And the the the, the intense uh, teenage involvement. You find that intense teenage involvement in dozens of different bands, and you find excellent musical output in dozens of different bands. They still and they create a lot of fans. They don't cre- have not created the kind of of uh, thing that's associated the with the culture. Band. It's, the it's culture. different. It's a totally different thing. Yeah, it's it so totally different, different that there's a. A uh, university professor in North Carolina that is studying them as an, as a specific mm-hmm. phenomena. phenomenon. Yeah. So what did you do with that? I well, you know, I mean, I was I went on. You know, they played for a while, and then they did, and they played again, and all these other things were going on. And then there was this one paranoid little sucker in there, and he thought something, and I picked up his thought because we were all linked together. It was this total telepathic loop. Which meant that it was like uh, like being in a very noisy cocktail party inside your head, uh-huh. and <laughs> and he this guy saw somebody come into the place that he thought was a narc. He thought narcs. I thought narcs. And I went right out the side door. I was gone. So was I because missed, it wasn't illegal yet, was it? There was all kinds of drugs going on there. It didn't matter. Yeah. It was just this guy's paranoia came it, it you know, on my party line, paranoia. and out I went. So I mean I don't I wasn't even uh, I don't think I was in the the the, the thing about me pushing the, the chair around was maybe you know ten or fifteen minutes. Well, wow. it was just and somebody then, else's and, then, and I saw right. one set of grateful <laughs> chair and or some other stuff right. and I was gone I was out I was uh-huh. running up the road. But you went to see them again? Oh yeah, but it was a while. I, that was that was so freaky. The whole that whole trip was so freaky that uh, that I thought. They were messing with something that was probably very dangerous, is what I mean. This is not so good. Well, wait, not so good? They were going to be bigger than the Beatles. This is not so good. That was them. That was my, that was, that was me standing in the room listening to them play their set. Uh huh. I thought that, right? And then, but then the, all the rest of the, then, then I went into, I went on a cosmic trip into other, other, uh, chambers of the universe and, and for the rest of that night, and then a few day, uh, the next day or a few days later, I, t- I talked to Casey. I says, "Hey, you know, you're messing with stuff from from ancient ancient stuff, right? This is and without any maps, <laughs> we're this maybe not uh, maybe need to be careful about this. It was kind of scary." And he kind of laughed at me. Well, it's sort of like the guy that uh, that gets on a roller coaster for the first time. Supposing some guy some guy was a uh, was a uh, it's uh, Yanomana, India or something, right? And he comes out of the forest and the first thing he does, somebody puts him on a roller coaster, right? He's never even seen civilization, somebody puts him on a roller coaster. Ah, uh, right? So his, right. He's going to go back and say, boy, civilization. No, he just, you know, no, no. <laughs> what it is, is that you'll, you'll get off that thing and say, that's very dangerous, that's scary, right? Oh, I see. And yet other people go around and around again and again and again. Wait, right? they're familiar you, with you it. had taken acid a lot. Oh, I take so it a lot. It wasn't the acid no, that was the scary no, part, it was the great blood that was no, the scary part. Grateful Dead. It was it had to do with the Grateful Dead. The linkage was the scary part. Yeah, the, the prankster thing. The prankster okay. thing, right? 
Live, which live the, mind. Yeah, which was, which the Grateful Dead were part of. I mean, Grateful Dead were, were right. pranksters. Right. They were musicians. They were also pranksters. It was like, um, I. The next time I saw them was at uh, the Fillmore Acid Test, and I met Phil. And uh, I walked over to him and I said, I'd like to work for you guys. Because I had decided that they, that this was the most amazing thing I'd ever run into. But he says, oh, he says, well, we don't have a, we don't have a manager. I said, I don't think I want to be a manager. He said, well, we don't have a sound man. I said, well, I don't know anything about that either, but I guess I could probably learn. Sounds more like more fun, huh? And uh, that's how that happened. And uh, for a long time, it was like no matter whatever else we were doing, we had to be at the acid test every week. That was it. They were, as part of it is totally committed part of it. No matter what other shows we did or anything else, Saturday night, we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, I don't know how many of those I would have gone to. I didn't actually think of myself as a prankster per se. I found it all kind of scary and I found it all every time was it provided days and days and days of sorting it out, putting it together trying to get it together. It was sort of like a, a crash course in how to become a jet pilot when you had never seen a jet before. <laughs> and the way they did it was they dropped you in there, took you up and said, the controls are yours! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Barrel rolls! <laughs> Immelmans! <laughs> you know, <laughs> tail spins right into the ground sometimes. Uh -huh. And, uh, but psychically, you recover from all those. I guess if you're tough, and I guess most of us were, occasionally some people weren't. It's unfortunate, but because of the way in which it was, uh, undertaken in those days, and the fact that we used to take huge amounts of acid. We used to take, you know, 250, 300 mics or more. Kizzy preferred 400 or more. And uh, Albert Hoffman told me that that was a substantial overdose. I said, yes, in retrospect, we realized it was. But what do you consider an optimum dose? Oh, I don't know. People nowadays seem to take around 100 or 150, something like that. All I know is that the result is that people, it's... You know, it's like uh, first you get in the, first you have training wheels on your bike <laughs> before you get the 1,000cc Yamaha, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a little different effect and the result is that people don't get so crazy, I guess. But in those days, everybody got kind of crazy and some people crash landed and other people um, managed to make it further down the road. But the whole scene became very, very, very loud and very weird. It attracted a lot of attention. It required, it, it attracted a lot of social concern mm. because a lot of people were experimenting with radically different social, uh, matrices, matrices, which were not, which, which were uh, frightening to the, our the cultural leaders and societal leaders, you know, the police and the legislatures and all the people who, bait, uh, the business community, basically the people who are concerned with maintaining a, a stable society saw this as a very uh, threatening and frightening phenomenon. There's a lot of people acting very weird and doing things that just didn't fit. And they uh, passed a lot of laws against it and tried to suppress it in various ways. Mm -hmm. whether, or not the, whether or not the psychedelics would have been in, uh, included in the, in, the various in, the, in the basic matrix of anti-drug laws or not, without the heavy influence of some people like Bart Linkletter, I doubt right. He was very... He made that myth about his daughter's yeah. suicide. That was a myth. Well, she did throw herself out a window, but, uh, you know, it was very convenient. I mean, that she was not on it, but just the fact that she had been oh. taking it. Right. Was it was not. Right. Somewhere in the past, oh, before she, she did it, she, she had taken it. No, there were a lot so. of, of bogus uh -huh. stories. Was several like other there people say things people like that. People went blind staring at the sun stories. I remember <laughs> those, right? Yeah. Santa Barbara, 1966. I do remember all Homosome this. Homosome damage. Yeah, see, now there was there were scientists and... ready to cough up all this crap yeah. Yeah. to suit the political agenda. Well, we still see that. But I, some I, I people don't do. So, the thing about crashing into the walls, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, we were taking large doses because that's what we thought was the right amount. And some people were, cra were psychically crashing into walls, yeah. and when nobody had, nobody knew about it. We didn't come. We didn't come with a shaman. 
with a with a uh, a thousand years or ten thousand years or a hundred thousand years of traditions and yeah. uh, and and the ring of people holding your hand to show you the right way to go it's not something that you started at puberty with it's something all of a sudden bang you're shot from a cannon and some people had a little problem with it and so some people uh, did themselves in when they weren't on it. Some people accidentally died when they were on it. Some people, hey, I can't justify that stuff. You know, I didn't know any more than anyone else, right? All I knew was that it was better to take a known substance in a known quantity than an unknown mixture of who knows what at God knows what quantity. That was the only difference. And as far as I was concerned, an advocate, I didn't tell anybody to go out and take it, you know, or anything else. But I knew I wanted to. I knew it was important to me. Mm -hmm. It was important. I didn't want to poison myself. I didn't like uh, Russian roulette with chemicals. And I didn't think it was appropriate. So uh, I would say then that what you were doing was essentially taking responsibility for it. Yeah. For yourself yeah. and for the people that you were uh, experimenting with. Yeah. Your partners. You might say. Uh, well, it's one way of looking at it. I, you know, every, it was all a matter of consent at that point. But the fact is, is that out in the out in the uh, culture as a whole, all kinds of bizarre things were happening, and uh, it, in fact, it bothered me. So, Give me an example. What do you mean? Well, I I see. I didn't know for a long time whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Eventually, I realized that the thing itself was neither good nor bad. What acid? Yeah. The acid culture. Well, Pop psychedelic piece? itself itself was neither good nor bad any more than a very sharp knife is good or bad, right? Right. You can use the yeah. knife to... Depends on how you to, use it. It's a tool. It's a sculpture. Right. You can use it to trim your nails. You can use it to cut up your food. Or you can use it to stab somebody. So the knife right. itself is not the, the operative thing there. But it took me a long time because of the fact yeah. that it was, it's so powerful and it changes consciousness so much. So you, you thought it was a good, intrinsically good thing at first? Uh, I didn't know. And that because was the reason right. why I, would, I cycled in and out of it for a long time. And it, eventually I decided that it was getting, we just getting too weird to handle. And well, then I would say that acid upset your moral construct. So it made me think about it very seriously. It, because it, of the fact of that, that, that things happened that weren't uh, positive, that non-positive things were happening as well as positive ones. Mm -hmm. Things like well, the, the example about the girl that uh, jumped out the window and Charles Manson. Yeah. And the fact that one person would would take acid and become like Gandhi, mm -hmm. and another person would, would take acid like some of the Hell's Angels and say, "Oh man, I love to get in a fight when I'm on acid." Why? Because everybody else is in slow motion. Uh, you know, right? Well, then Kesey said, "Hey, all this does is turn up your volume. The basic nature of the person is simply amplify." Right. right. Well, in a social context, you can understand how those who are uh, who feel responsible for the social matrix itself don't want something that may produce uh, these kind of effects. Once again, you're listening to an interview with Owsley Stanley, a.k.a. The Bear, an amazing character, as everybody who's called in has observed, uh, with a lot of tremendous things to say. Um, he passed away in a, a car accident um, at the age of 76 on March 13th in Australia, which had been his uh, adopted home for uh, several years. Uh, this interview was originally recorded uh, in January of 1991, and most of it appeared in my book, Conversations with the Dead, which is still available um, uh, mostly, I think, as an e-book. You can get it from Amazon. Anyway, let's continue with the interview. You were asking me, basically, how, how you thought... The Grateful Dead scene related to psychedelics. I don't know how it relates to psychedelics. All I know is that at one point, I joined up with a band that was that were pranksters, that were part of a scene, that was doing something that was right out on the edge, right out on the edge of uh, consciousness, the edge of, of social, the edge of magic, the edge of music, that was very dynamic. A band composed of five guys that were amongst the smartest people I'd ever run across. The most, I mean, to get, to find that many really smart people, people that were, that minds operated in the same function zone that mine did, that was absolutely could carry on the most, you know, tenuous and stratospheric of conversations with nobody getting lost. 
-hmm. that blew my mind number one uh -huh. you know it's not unusual to find that 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 kind of a bunch and I've been I've worked for a lot of bands I've been on the road I've worked in halls where they come through a different band every day in festival situations I've worked in situations where I've had a lot of contact with a lot of musicians uh -huh. and by and large I find there's a great many really bright guys involved in the music scene. Yeah, really, But to yeah. find that many all in one group is truly unique. Now that prankster scene didn't sustain that much longer. Than well, that. you know, it was sort of like if you set fire to a skyrocket, it's going to be brilliant as hell, but it, it, it don't go very far and it don't last very long. Uh -huh. It was, uh, it was, it, it, it attracted so much social pressure on the individuals that it had it not been for you know Keezy getting busted and, and all these other things happening and the intense amount of, of, of social and and um, and uh, police pressure on it that it who knows how far or where it would have gone but as it was it did its it did its thing ultra spectacularly but it was by by necessity it had to follow that old prankster saying nothing lasts Right. It lasted as long as it did, and then that was it. Even in the beginning, there was a great reluctance to get weird at regular shows. There was a, no reluctance to get weird at the acid test because it, they said if they can't play, it doesn't matter. If right. they don't play well, it doesn't matter because nobody's paying to see them. It's not a matter of uh, having an audience that you're performing for. It's just a big party. But they were... They, they had to be at the party. They were an essential part of the party in their minds. They, that was an essential thing that had to be done every Saturday night, uh -huh. which I found uh, not to my liking at first because, well, it was a little too weird and a little too heavy, and it got it was hard to control, and I was it, it looked like um, too much exposure and made too much heat, and it, I don't know all those things. Okay, so I, I, I would I was. A, a, I was not a real loud thing at that point, and I didn't want to be a loud thing or attract a lot of attention for any reason. Uh -huh. And here was this theme that was so loud that if you put it on the moon, it would attract attention, right? I so I was thinking that maybe, and I, here was this band of incredible musicians making this magic music, which I thought was more important <laughs> to, to do that than to do this other crazy thing. So you were right? sort of an impetus toward professionalism at that point? I've always been that. In the old days, you went to a show, and there was no spotlights on the band. Mm -hmm. There was a light show, and there was a lot of other stuff going on, and it was like a huge party anyway. And the band never uh, were flashy dressers or anything, and they, they, never, they never sought being in the floodlights or with footlights or anything. It wasn't like that. It was the music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't believe that there was ever a, a time that the band wasn't more concerned about playing music. People who go and say this, that, and the other about the Grateful Dead show are people that can't hear the music. The music to them sounds like it's meandering, or it sounds like it doesn't have a center or a focus or anything else. Well, um, true, from time to time it doesn't. But on many levels, it always has something happening. There's always a level at which it is happening. Mm -hmm. The thing is that uh, some more straight people that go and sit down at the show, if the show isn't one of those dynamic, tight events, which maybe one out of four or five is, totally. If it has any moments of musical uh, misshapenness or, or uh, elaborate bridges or just... just, just uh, heavy sections that are jazz-like but never quite gel and focus, which sometimes happens because any improvisational music will have that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've even heard Keith Jarrett get into those kind of bags where he'll go meandering off somewhere and it, it, it just yeah. doesn't come back to where mm -hmm. you might like to see it come. It goes on, sometimes to gel, sometimes it doesn't. I, I think that that influence in the music tends to make it that way and if you've got somebody going to see something like that that's not jazz oriented or it d cannot really hear the kind of musical ideas that are going on won't know and they'll say uh, you know they're all over the place and this that and the other no focus and no direction all that you hear that all the time and that, of course, but that, that is dilutes music. the gestalt energy in the building I don't think so you don't oh, those people gestalts do not always uh, uh, are not always composed of everyone. No, I, I'm they not can be saying composed of more or less. Part, the more uh, 
dissipation of that stuff there is, the less... I mean, the more unanimity, the better, I would tend to think. Would you? No. No, I would, no. No, I think, in fact, the presence of... the presence of every kind of person, the presence of every different level of of, uh, engagement and disengagement Mm -hmm. uh, is more important. I'll go along with that. It's like... It's like a reaction vessel that has all of the pieces of whatever can be made. And it, it makes something. But it well, doesn't use of all of the pieces is, all the time. Is the idea that your most distracted person can suddenly snap too, right? Isn't that one of the things that you would want to see happen in that realm? That well, all of a sudden the music finds its focus and all of a sudden the wandering minds find their focus as well. I mean, that's one of those fun things about Grateful Dead is hauling somebody in there is unsuspecting and watching them get it. Sometimes they do. But then it's like a sculpture. Yeah. When If you look at a sculpture, what you're looking at is the surface. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's inside it. Yeah. But there's more inside than there is surface. Yeah. So most of what a, a, of a sculpture is, when you look at it, is indeterminate. It could be nothing. Or it could be something. Or it could be another sculpture. Or dozens of sculptures. Or just random noise. Because all, all you perceive in the sculpture is the form itself. Not the substance within. And the, the thing that you're talking about, that like gestalt consciousness, is also like that. In fact, I have a, a strong tendency to use sculptural uh, viewpoints in most things. And for instance, when I'm working with sound, I work with sound in a three-dimensional fashion which to me is palpably three-dimensional. I do that in the way in which I set up uh, stage miking for a live show, the way in which I orient speakers, the uh, kinds of, 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 of electrical uh, things that I do to the sound. And to me, it is physical. And you can walk through the hall and feel its shape and change. Um, for instance, uh, you experience uh, a certain spatial form, dimensionality, if you listen to old and in the way with a set of headphones or something, even with speakers. They move around the room. You seem to be moving around the stage. It changes as you move around. It's still it's valid, but it's like you'll be one time you'll be on one side, one time you'll be on another side, and sometime you'll be in the middle of it. It always it's always coherent. It's always three dimensional. But the spatial image changes and your perception of it changes. But it seems palpable. It seems mm-hmm. real, like a sculpture. Mm-hmm. It's the way I look at sounds. The way I that it has something it flashes back to that Time when I saw the sound coming out of the speakers. Oh. I understood that just from reading the copy on the back of the Holden and the Way album. I yeah. understood what you said in there about that was that you know if you mic it properly, all that stuff will happen. You know, yeah. you don't need discrete tracks and all that stuff. That's right. I mean, I, you know, I didn't understand the, the technology behind it, and maybe I still don't. But I've always understood that, and I've always believed that if you put your mics up in the right place, you will get something more than discrete well, miking and stuff will get you. I mean, but that's a oh, bluegrass band always mixes itself. Well, that helps. Yeah. It helps because they move in and out of the mics and around the mics. But it took me six months to figure out what to do with the mics to make that happen. A lot of listening, a lot of thinking, a lot of understanding, a lot of um, playing them back. Um, you know, the... Hmm. Uh, I, uh, you know that we're talking about something that happened uh, 19 years ago, right. and well, well, I can do a totally different thing now because I know more about mics and more about other things. But I still only use two tracks. Right. That, I think that's the point. That, that you still don't need more than two you don't need tracks more than two. Right? But let's go back to where we were. Because work up to every it. because the way in which your ears work, you've only got two ears. And it's the shape of the ear changes, but you can detect all kinds of different things with the information from two auditory sensing units, one on each side of your head. Those two units create a totally three-dimensional space in your, in your mind. And that three-dimensional space, which is created from your senses, is as illusory as, as the reality of the sound. But what your ears do is they tap into the total matrix of what is in the room. All the energy that's in the room, whether it's bouncing off a wall or coming from the the speaker or whatever, enters your ears. And inside, your brain sorts it out. Because of the fact that humans use language as the single most important survival tool they have. Our mouths are modified for it. 
our ears, our brains are modified for it. Our brain does a tremendous amount. I hear a lot of stuff. I watched a, a, a TV program called Cats um, Caressing the Tiger, where they were talking about the, the ability of the cat to localize sound. And then I've read things about the dolphins and their use of sound and the bats and their use of sound. And owls, most owls hunt as much with their ears as they do with their eyes. In fact, the facial disc of a barn owl is extremely important. Owls, two ears are different sizes, different right. shapes, yes. Different. The feathers on one side of the head are different than the feathers on the other side. And I have something like that. When I was 19, I had uh, a diving accident when I jumped off a high board where I was learning some clown dives from a bunch of Hawaiians that were, that were in the military station in D.C. were coming to that pool that I was working as lifeguard. Yeah. They were teaching me these clown dives. And one of the clown dives, you go off and you go in on your side with your hand over your ear. But you put that up at the last minute and I missed. Oops. The water went in and uh, almost shattered my eardrum. didn't, but it caused a heavy hemorrhage which filled the entire inner ear with blood. Mm -hmm. And there was no way to get it out. The doctor didn't want to cut the ear, the eardrum and take it out, aspirate it. Mm -hmm. Maybe he should have, I don't know. But anyway, but I guess... That it was it wasn't the way he did it, and antibiotics in those days were pretty primitive. The result is that by the time my body had absorbed that that blood clot, some bacteria and mold together had had established a culture in there, and the result of the culture was that it it, it uh, produced something sort of like uh, arthritis. The three little bones that articulate together, mm -hmm. and it produced a kind of arthritis in those bones. There's nothing wrong with the eardrum. There's nothing wrong with the nerves. But the linkage between the eardrum and the nerves has to go through this bridge of bones, which the articulation of which was interfered with by the scar tissue caused by that infection. The result is that the two ears have a slightly different uh, shape, mm -hmm. uh, response shape. So as far as my brain is concerned, there's absolutely no confusion about which ear is which. Just like the owl with the two different shaped feather things and the different shaped ear holes gives them a totally different signal from the two sides of their heads, which allows them to pinpoint the mouse or whatever they're after very precisely. Mm -hmm. And if you look at most animals that, re that need a highly developed stereoscopic sense in their hearing, they have this uh, unbalance between the two sides. And so Man's ears are not normally that different. But due to this injury, it's a funny thing where a handicap becomes an advantage. Due to this injury and the psychedelics, which amplify everything, I was able to sort it all out. So I produced a sound picture where all the high frequency stuff is actually coming from my left ear. Because the right ear above like 6,000 cycles isn't very sharp. We're listening to an interview with the late, great Owsley Stanley, a.k.a. Bear, recorded on uh, January 13th of 1991 and published in a book called Conversations with the Dead, which is available in used bookstores and also online for um, you know, e-books and Kindles and all that stuff through Amazon and elsewhere. Conversations with the Dead is the name of the book. The subject of the interview is Owsley Stanley. The interviewer is me, David Gans. The date was January 13th, 1991. And let's listen to the last 20 minutes I have for you this evening. Yeah, I knew nothing when I started. I just said, hey, uh, sure, I'll be the sound man, and uh, we can use my hi-fi. I didn't know anything about it, uh, but I did notice one thing straight away, and that was that the instruments that they were using looked like somebody built them in their garage. When you opened them up, they looked like they had parts that looked like they came out of a, a 1932 radio. And in fact, it was, the, it was yeah. about right. Yeah. That was about right. It was, uh, I think it was Les Paul who took apart a, a radio uh, and put the parts in his guitar. And that's where it all started. So you discovered Basically, the, the guitars in 1966 were identical. They, they still had magnet the coil of wire around it, six screws in the top of the magnet, and sometimes not even the screws, but often the screws. They had a wax capacitor and a, and a cheap uh, potentiometer. That was it. And uh, crude, very crude. 
the wiring looked like the wiring I used to take out of old radios from World War II and uh, and from old, old uh, wooden house radios. The insides of those radios, the capacitors, the parts, the, the pots, the wires, everything looked the same as, as what you'd find in the back of a Gibson or a Fender or whatever. And uh, the bodies themselves didn't seem to be all that well constructed. Now, was, I thought, well, hey, number one, the amplifiers and the instruments look like they're from pre-World War II, and here we are with a technology that is uh, putting things in orbit around the Earth. And I thought, what has changed in the days of, of Bach? The highest technology that man could produce built the organs that he played. And here, the, the musicians, the equivalent of Bach, modern musicians that are writing and playing music, are forced to play with something that looks like it belongs to World War I, World War II period. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. But I'm not an engineer. I never was. So I thought, we got to do something about this. And so I started looking around for someone who could help. And uh, I ran into this kid, uh, Tim Scully. And he seemed to know about electronics. It, I thought, hey, I need somebody. You want to do it? He said, okay. So he was a bright kid, real bright. He knew enough about electronics, how to wire two or three parts together. All I knew basically was what I had learned uh, to be an electronic technician in the in the uh, my Air Force period. Mm -hmm. I you know I was a ham radio operator and I knew something about the theory operation of radios and I'd worked as a as a broadcast technician, but I wasn't a design engineer and I more or less understood how things work and I knew how to solder stuff together so I could build things, but. I wasn't. A, I didn't consider myself a design engineer in any way, shape, or form. I didn't really want to, but I knew we had to do something because the technology was so primitive that it seemed like it was holding the music back. That we could go to another level if we had better instruments. Half the time they crackle and pop and hum, and the and there would be distortion out of the speakers. It wouldn't be controllable, and the guys would make a sound not what they wanted or. So we went wholly the other way, and we tried using hi-fi stuff. And hi-fi stuff, it turned out, wasn't heavy-duty enough. And the, the voices of the theater speakers weren't strong enough. And I went down with Tim. We, we went down and talked to the engineers at Altec Lansing. They weren't interested. They were produce, uh, They said, well, you want power here, use this driver. And that driver rolled off at 3,000 hertz. Uh, oh, you want it to go higher. Uh, well, we have this one. It goes to 9,000 and that one, but it would only take two and a half watts. This would take 50 watts, but it, it wouldn't go up. I said, no, no, we want one that's this powerful. It'll go twice as far out as that. We want to go to 15,000. Well, you can't do that. We don't want to. We're not interested. Besides, we sell all the speakers we make anyway. Get lost. <laughs> so we went as far as we could and we tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and made all kinds of stuff and even tried centralized and eventually got to the point where in uh, the fall of, of 66 it had grown like topsy into this thing which was more of a problem it required a separate pilot over there controlling things while the band was playing which was unsatisfactory it didn't always produce just the kind of sounds that it was supposed to which was a problem the musicians felt that it was like carrying a, 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 a giant thing on there along around with them all the time it didn't work and so one day we had this big meeting and they said we can't do it I said okay okay fine no problem um, go over to the uh, to Leo's and pick out whatever you think you would be right and go buy a regular piece yeah 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 go no 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 all their amplifiers, everything, their guitars all plugged into this box that Tim had Oh, I Everything see. went into this box. Oh. And then out of the box it went into the amplifiers, then oh, it went into the speakers, right? But all went through this, this gadget. Was it, what did I have in it? Buffers and switches and all, stuff? Oh, I don't know. He built it. Uh -huh. I, I'm not the engineer. He was the engineer. He built it. So thing. everybody plugged into this box. Nobody and knew what to do. their signals to the other stuff. Yeah, and it was which made them completely dependent on Scully. And they could and control their stuff and some changes over there, but he was watching that. I was out in the front doing this and this. The whole thing just, and, and it would, it sometimes, it was, the thing was that nobody could define what it was that it had to do. The musicians themselves couldn't. They say, well, I play the guitar and I want to hear a sound. What kind of a sound? Well, yeah, this is the right sound. And it, you know, the musicians couldn't talk about it. And I hadn't a clue. I just knew that it, that what was was too primitive. 
And Tim, he didn't have a clue as to what to do. So we were constantly <laughs> changing things, wiring stuff, trying to find out how to make it do whatever it was that nobody could describe, that everybody in their own way knew, but nobody could communicate about it. It was not something to be defined, right? So they, that was this was just like one of those dead ends that you go off along, right? So we went off along it, but it finally got to a point where it it was just not working and everybody sat down and they said, hey, it's not working. And I said, fine, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's working. And they said, uh, well, uh, we want to do something different. I said, fine, go to the music store and, and uh, pick out what you want. And, so this uh, was where you be began being there. And they said, and then what? I says, well, I'll buy all the stuff you have now for the amount of money it takes to buy all the stuff ah. you need, right? So I'll, we'll make a trade. So they went and got all the stuff that they wanted, and I took all the stuff, and so then I went and sold it all off. And I sold some to the straight theater, and some to Bill Graham, and some to this, and some to that. So, so it, it all got sold. It all got gotten rid of. Some of it I gave away. A lot of it I gave away. Mm -hmm. But the point was is that there, it, by that time, of course, there was a lot of other things going on. For one thing, we'd learned how to improve some of the other kinds of amps. And we improved the physical instruments by putting high quality components in them. Mm -hmm. Instead of twenty, instead of two dollars and fifty cents worth of parts, we put twenty five dollars worth of parts. That alone improved a lot of things. Uh -huh. And so, and we'd learned how to make better chords and stuff, and lots of things that had improved. But at that point, I went on off because it was something else I had to do. They went all off with this stuff and started playing. And one of the people that joined up with him at that point was Healy. And Healy is a very pragmatic kind of a guy who liked to tinker with stuff and fix stuff, right? Not that he was a design engineer, he wasn't, but he was a, a consummate um, troubleshooter. He could go into something that wasn't working and find out what wasn't working and fix it. And so he was fixing this sort of stuff and he was, in his very pragmatic approach, led him to go and just rent a whole bunch of, of uh, speakers. And he'd rent like three times, four times as many drivers as he needed, right? So they'd blow everything up in the first set. And he'd pull off the blown up part, put on another set, play, this, play this halfway through the second set. And he'd be take, up there taking them down, fixing them, putting them back. And the thing was that the rental companies would get all this stuff back and it'd be just blown to bits, right? Every time he'd blown to bits, right? Uh -huh. And yet it was money they'd rent. They'd pay the price and they'd take the thing up and they always came back blown up, right? And so they went down to Altec and they were big enough, right? They were... So we Yeah, right, there. right. <laughs> went down to Altec and said, hey, man, hey, this is no good. Altec started working on the stuff, right? We couldn't do it. We went year, two years before, uh -huh. begged them to do it. Nobody would do it, right? As soon as it, as soon as it started to be dollar and cents, oh well, we can rent this stuff, right? Rent it, blow it up, take it back. We don't, we don't have to worry about. It. We can buy it and rent it next time. They, they raise the rental price a little bit, but they can't because they got to rent to all these guys that aren't blowing it up. They can't make a special price to you because you'll go to their competitor, which, they, which, which was what happened. It was two or three different rental companies, and so. The, all this stuff was suddenly, suddenly Altec was getting all, and, and JBL and all these guys were getting all this blown up stuff, right? So they had to make it. They, it was no longer a point of why improve it, people are buying as much as we make. It now was, they had a market It was, to put, we, we put a, a financial twist on it, right? We started tweaking their ass real uh -huh. hard because they, it was expensive to replace right. these. And so s suddenly the big manufacturing concerns that had a, a monopoly on the sound market, were suddenly forced into doing these things. And then uh, I went through the whole thing, and uh, in 1968, the carousel ballroom thing came together. And uh, I was sound man at that place, along with Bob Matthews. And I started tinkering with the little amplifiers, specifically uh, uh, a musician named Alvin Bishop asked me if I couldn't improve the sound in his uh, little Princeton app that he liked to play, but, which wasn't very loud. He had to constantly be mic'd in the PA. And one time he played in there and he said, well, you know, it's, I, I, I wish it were louder, but I don't want a twin reverb because it's too much. I want this little guy. Princeton River. So I started taking it all apart and, and applying some rule of thumb principles and changing a few things and putting a different power supply and 
the little hot rod uh, trip on the output stage that I'd learned from a, working for a cheapo hi-fi company once back in the past and did a few things to it and it came out of screaming. It put a 12 inch speaker but left the 10 inch hole in the front board, made a heavy duty front board and bolted it in there so it, it choked it a little bit. And it was it turned it into a real screamer, man. The thing What's was the really cool. What's the principle there? Putting, I don't know. A, putting a twelve inch speaker on a ten inch hole. See if it works. And it worked. Yeah. It did something. Yeah. Useful. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't sound good. It didn't sound as good if you made the hole big. Because we tried that. Oh. Because the original boards were made out of chipboard. You know that pressed wood fiber, which wouldn't hold the power of the speaker. Right. So we always had to make a new board. And so we, we made a new board. We tried it with a with a 12 inch hole, and we tried it with the regular hole that was originally on it. Because originally I just bolted the sucker in. I didn't do anything. I just bolted it in. So that and it only stuff. sounded good. It sounded best with the smaller hole. So, How, did you just accidentally do that, or say uh, just what the? F let's try that to see. I I said I don't feel I didn't feel like taking a hole saw and cutting a hole out. So I just. just Unbolted well one on speaker and bolted the other speaker in. You know, all I did is drill four holes for that. Uh -huh. It was easy. Mm -hmm. And it worked. And that's so it sounded good. It sounded, yeah. Elvin liked the way it sounded. Then that was that. Then I built, them, I built, it for, built one for Yorma, for Garcia, and a bunch of other people. A lot of people did it. I went up for a while having a little sort of a production shop back at the carousel, hot rodding these, these uh, speakers. I'd, Drill an extra hole in the front, put a middle control so it had treble, middle, and bass. Because hmm. basically the thing is, the, the circuit's very similar to the one in the Twin River. Mm -hmm. Just it had the small tubes, single small tubes, and this little uh, speaker in it. Mm -hmm. But it's, if you got the industrial versions of the tubes, and then I built a power supply that super filtered all the low stages and put raw AC on the plates, just practically raw, unfiltered. You put I used a, a choke input. That's with all the filtering it got. So I had had the max. The choke went to the to the lower stages, to the to the screen grid and to the lower stages in the amplifier. And the no, plates I, the plates got the raw the raw high voltage, right? We used we replaced the little little uh, rectifier tube with diodes. Uh -huh. And then that went directly into a cap. So it had max voltage. But no filtering, no resistors, no filtering. It just went right straight into the plate. So they had max voltage there, right? And then... Which gave it more power? It gave it max voltage, right, on the plate. Uh -huh. And the output, the output power was dependent on the plate voltage. Oh, okay. But the control, the amplifying characteristics and the noise in there was controlled by the screen grid and by the lower stages. And those were well filtered because we ran it through a, a filter choke before it got to the screen grid. And the choke well, is a coil. Filter choke's much better filter than a resistor. Mostly, what was originally was in there is a series of resistors and capacitors. But a and choke is a coil, right? Coil, yeah. And it's, it's just a coil. very dense coil. Well, it's, uh, well, it looks like a transformer. It's only got one winding instead uh -huh. of two. It looks like a little... It's not inducing a voltage in another circuit. It's no, it does it through, but it's doing what to it? It doesn't let the AC component go through. It resists the flow of alternating current. And a filter, a filter choke, which is what that was, is a choke that's designed to filter the uh, the hum out of a uh, out of a power supply. It's designed for that. Mm -hmm. But and, and that's what a rectifier does. Also, it takes or, in AC and puts out uh, DC. Yeah, and a, a rectifier is a one-way valve that lets the electricity through in one direction only. Mm -hmm. And you you pr you can produce a circuit, which is called a full-way bridge, that that lets through one half, and then Inverts and lets through the other half, so that it wow, so you get the maximum power, get but all in one power thing. out of both halves of the wave, but it 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 goes to zero, so it's rough, it's bumpy. There's mm -hmm. an AC ripple, as they call it, the mm -hmm. hum. That's what the hum you hear in an amplifier or something. That's that AC ripple okay. getting through. So the choke, chokes are expensive. You like you have to pay like six or seven bucks. Most manufacturers stick a bunch of resistors in there, which cost twenty cents, and it's a you know it's a five watt or ten watt. And he put a he put a series of resistors with capacitors, and but the but the resistor resists the AC and the DC component. It shows no discrimination, and so you're depending upon the capacitors to short the AC to, to uh, the ground, okay. and the resistor gives them something to work against. Right. And you can you can actually compute a, a, a time factor if you want, but usually use great big caps and small resistors. Okay. But by using one choke coil in there, 
the voltage doesn't drop much going through it because it doesn't have as much resistance in it as the, as the resistor would have. So you're keeping your voltage up and you're, you, and you're blocking the, the, most of the AC. And you've got a big cap on the front of it anyway because it's not a swinging choke, it's a filtering choke. Mm -hmm. And that big cap is directly feeding the plates. So the plates have got the full peak-to-peak -peak voltage that's coming out of the power supply, which in this case was like 400 volts or something instead of 300 and then 60, it was like 420 or something like that. But it's real rough because it's still got a lot of ripple on it. But the ripple doesn't matter because it's a push-pull circuit and the, the amplification is controlled by the screen and the screen was filtered on with this choke on it so it was super smooth so it was a dead quiet amplifier with the uh, with he still had the same little basic tubes except we used the military version of the tube. Okay, right, right. I remember that stuff. Seventy five oh eights instead of six V sixes. So it was uh -huh. a military. So it was a a, a, a a rugged tube that could take all the abuse in a big speaker in a small box and would shake itself to pieces. We used military versions for the, all the tubes in it. So and, you uh, immediately like reduced the headache factor at these gigs, I'd imagine, considerably, right? Well, the whole idea was to try to bring the equipment, which is basically pre-war design. It was vacuum tubes. It was, you know, we'd, we'd open up one of those things and be full of wax capacitors. Right. We'd pull all those things out and put modern mylars and take apart old TV chassis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you get an old, you get an old early TV, and it looked just like the inside of a Fender, right from the factory. Right. So, right, right. For one thing, Garcia would would be playing twin reverbs, and all of a sudden the, the tubes would, would would go red hot, and, and the bridge would melt out. The, the tubes would melt down. Mm -hmm. Blow the tubes out totally. Right. There's there's four of these big tubes in there, and they were not cheap. These were the output tubes. These were the output tubes. They just all turn red hot and go, just like that. Bang. Right. And we. Take the they take the amplifier and test it, and test it. Couldn't find it was wrong. Couldn't find it was wrong, right? And uh, eventually, I think it was Wickersham or someone managed to put some clips on there, or it might have been Keeley. I don't know, but somewhere along the line, someone tested the thing right at the moment of failure. So what happened was the these. Um, Factory supplied capacitors were like 600 volt caps, and it went between the plate of the driver tube and the grid of the output tube. So they were the driver that blocked the, the the plate voltage off the grid, and the voltage on the on the driver tubes was something like 360 volts. And so 600 volts is well, it's almost twice the voltage you expect it to be fine. Mm -hmm. But what uh, we discovered right. was the way you could the way the guitar was being played, the way Garcia was playing it, was producing voltage spikes that were running upwards of seven or 800 volts. Uh -huh. they punch a hole in the capacitor, which would put the full plate voltage of the driving stage directly on the grid, driving it to 300 volts positive. The it would it would yeah, it would, it momentarily, it was short. But as soon as that had happened and you turned the thing off, it would heal. And it would... Oh, so that's what happens when you exceed the voltage rating of the capacitor, is it just passes it straight through? No, it just happened that the, 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 these intense spikes would weaken, it would have a, it would be a weak place somewhere, and not always, sometimes, uh, there would be a weak place, it would, pierce, it would pierce through, the voltage spike would go through, blow the output tubes off, you shut the amp down, uh -huh. turn it back on, it's fine, because <laughs> the, <laughs> the capacitor would heal, right? We found out that if you put 800 volt ones in there, then it was a long time for three failures. And if you put 1,000 or 1,600 volts in there, no more problems. 1,600 volts never failed. Thousands might fail. 800s would take a long time to fail, and 600s would forget it. We tried to tell Fender about that, you know? Uh -huh. He says, we never heard of it. Okay, one last segment here with Owsley Stanley, a.k.a. Bear. This is all about the technical issues of the Grateful Dead at Woodstock. You were asking me, basically, how, how you thought the Grateful Dead seemed yeah. related to psychedelics. I don't know. Wrong hit. It's this one. I mean, I chased down and, and pulled ground loops out of every radio station I worked for. Every single one had ground loops in it. And so when, if, you can, if you can get rid of uh, radio frequency ground loops, hey, audio is a cinch. So right from the get-go with the dead, we got rid of all that stuff. It was very rare. The only time that we had a serious problem was at Woodstock. 
And the reason we had a problem with Woodstock was that the transmitter that they were using to, to, for the radio signal for their helicopters was grounded in one place and the stage was grounded in another place. There were two ground rods driven to the ground and it was separate. Uh -huh. The result was that the, there was two, the, the ground system on the stage was not a, the same ground potential that the, that the transmitter was at. Uh -huh. So all the equipment on the stage was acting as a supplemental antenna, receiving the signal from the... <laughs> <laughs> and it was everything. It was worst of all in Phil's base. For yes. some reason, it really focused in on Phil's base. And we were going nuts trying to figure it out because it had been going on all the time. Every band had played. It was having this problem. And You're so the only ones that stopped the with it, right? Well... I got the I got the the house electrician, and we started searching, and we found that the two ground rods, and I said that's it. So we pulled the we pulled the the ground connection off the the from the stage off that rod, ran it over the other side of the stage, and clipped it on to the same rod that the that the uh, transmitter was going into it. That was it. Thanks. Gone. History. How long did it take you to find that out? Um, about. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Oh, really? Yeah. Then what was the interminable delay at Woodstock? I, there was a lot of delays for a lot. Of, oh, here, 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 what the delay was. The guys who had set this thing up had this idea. They had these half cookies, big half cookies. They were like 20 feet or 25 feet. It was like a circle, big circle, 25 feet oh, diameter, made out of plywood with uh, two by fours underneath that was split down the middle into two cookies, half mm -hmm. pieces. With, with casters underneath them. Right. And they'd set a band up on a half cookie. And then they set another band up back to back on the half cookie. Right? And they wrote, for the set changes, they'd rotate this, this thing around like a wheel. And they'd pull one off and slide another half cookie over oh, with right. another band. That way they, they, they could so, set them up over on the side. They had like three or four of these cookies, right? So they you're set loading one in, one was performing and one was loading out. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. So, Right, exactly. So there was no problems with the setup. Really idea, but... But! <laughs> Ramrod and I took one look at that, and we said to the guy, that ain't going to work. Yes, it is. No, you don't understand. Our gear is so heavy that that will break. You can't put the Grateful Dead on one of those cookies. You've got to go on the cookie. We we're telling you, it's going to be a mistake. It's going to be much simpler. Let us set up behind these guys, take them off, and then the other one can come in, we'll take it off, we'll move it as fast as we can get a couple of other crews, we got plenty of people. No, no, you've got to go on the cookie. I'm telling you it's a mistake. You gotta go on the cookie. Okay. So we set up on the cookie, right? We set up on the cookies. Sure enough, the thing hadn't rotated ten degrees and all the casters went wham. <laughs> ten degrees. Wham. So not only that, now we had to set we had to do all this while people were waiting because the other band, they could shove their cookie off, but there we were. There was no way it was too heavy. No, the whole so thing couldn't move it. Assembly. We had to just take take them off and move them. Had to do the whole setup. That was a delay. <laughs> we tried to tell them. It might be a little longer, but not a lot longer. But because they could have shoved the other cookie out of the way, we've right. been set up. We've set up the drums. The whole thing would have worked. They wouldn't go for it. That's all we have time for tonight. That's uh, You've been listening to an interview with the late, great Owsley Stanley, a.k.a. Bear. His website, which had a lot of his essays and articles and thoughts on all sorts of things. And as you can tell, the man had a lot of ideas about a lot of things. His website is the Bear. Dot .org you'll also find some stuff about him on Wikipedia and that's it for me it's time for Larry Kelp and his program Sing Out I will see you next Wednesday evening at 8 here on Dead to the World and uh, please stay tuned for Sing Out